So, uh, we ultimately finished whatever the day was last Thursday talking about price discrimination, which is something especially the monopolies have the power to do, is they can charge customers different prices for the exact same item based on characteristics of the customer. And it's discrimination. Price discrimination is not necessary. It's not that discrimination word discrimination, it doesn't mean an evil thing. And price discrimination in this case, it's not evil. You get a discount. Is that evil? No, that's good. But but what did the word discrimination means treating people differently based on their characteristics. In this case, price discrimination, price of charging is different for different people because they have a characteristic of them. Because of their age, because of their height, because of their gender, we're going to give you a different price, which is a good thing. Where you have, you know, you've had racial discrimination, which is where you're going to treat somebody differently because of their skin color. You have gender discrimination where they treat people differently because of their gender, as far as, you know, back in the day where you could sit on a bus and all that kind of stuff, and what bathrooms you can use and all that kind of mess. Um, but it still is this discrimination. The word discrimination as a whole isn't mean. It's just in certain aspects, certain kinds of discrimination are mean, are bad, and it's the you know, the mean stuff. We're going to mistreat people because of some characteristic they have. But you can treat people better because of some characteristic they have. You know, um, how nice to yell at each other. Hey, how nice would you be to a two-year-old kid that came in here? Probably nicer, right? You treat that two-year-old kid nicer than you treat me. Okay, you would. Oh, I thought you were shaking your head down. Okay, good. You don't like your No. Uh, wait, a, a, a cat wants to walk in here. Would you treat that cat better than you treat me? Probably, maybe, unless you hate cats. Well, I wouldn't pet you. So. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> but hopefully, you wouldn't kick the cat. Would you kick me for the opportunity came up? Probably. Yeah. So, so, I mean, that's what discrimination is. It's treating people differently because of the characteristics they have. Sometimes that's good, like giving you a discount. Sometimes it's bad, like treating you unfairly. Um, but I just wanted to, I started to say that the other day, but you know, just, just wrap your minds around that. But the kinds of price discrimination, we're charging people different prices for the same product based on their age, or gender, their income, student discount. But this is all to sell to people that we wouldn't ordinarily get to sell to. I can't remember if I really drove that one home to Thursday, so that's fine. It's like, Grandma ain't going to come and eat at a restaurant five times a week. If she had to pay full price, she can't afford it. But lower the price lets her come and eat more often. You know, families aren't going to be going to the movies very often unless they can go in the middle of the afternoon and get in there cheap. Because that gets us way, it gets us in there with the kids when it's cheaper, and plus it gets us in there with the kids when y'all are out there on a date making out on the back row of the movie theater because my kids don't need to see that, right? Y'all know who you are. So, is it, so that, that's what, you know, it, it's all about getting, getting sales that you wouldn't ordinarily get. If you're ordinarily going to get them at your normal price, then you just keep charging the normal price. But if their customer is not willing to pay the normal price, not able to pay the normal price, then you adjust the price to find a price that they are able and willing to pay. And part of this is and part of this is a little bit forward thinking, building goodwill that I suggested a little bit last time. The you know, yeah, your grandma gets to sing your sister's discounts, so and sometimes y'all will go to the restaurant with grandma. And sometimes maybe y'all have a little warm spot in your heart for that restaurant because you remember going to that restaurant with grandma and how nicely they treated grandma by like giving her a discount. So maybe you'll keep eating at that restaurant afterwards. Student discounts. Why? Because we're poor. You're poor. No. So, so hey, right now you're poor. So if they didn't give you a discount, you wouldn't be going there. Oh, we have a soft time for student discounts. $1,200 off the top of their office. $600 brand new store. That's fine. That's fine. All that was seniors. That I'm seniors. <laughs> Student discount. Most of it was. There's a three XL bond too that took oh, off a marginal percentage of it, but most of it was student discount. Wow, that's oh, just the big one. Okay, I mean that, that's awesome. Yeah, there. Thank you for sharing with the rest of us so we can take advantage of that opportunity. 
Moving right along. Uh, no, the first thing you do is you wipe Windows off so you put Linux on there. That's okay. So, uh, but the other thing, y'all don't have money now, but are y'all gonna have money five years from now? Hopefully, because hopefully y'all gonna be you're gonna graduate, you're gonna have your degree, you're gonna be getting a paycheck that is above average for the area, right? So they want to have their hooks in now. That's why Dell and Best Buy just sold Bobby that laptop for discount. They may not have made any profit whatsoever on this laptop, but they're hoping that he's gonna be like five years from now. I bought this Dell and it was a solid computer and it did me good for five years and it's time for another computer. I remember how good that one was. I'm going to get another Dell. That's the thinking there. So part of this thinking here is forward looking to get your hooks into the customers in, in the future. And then part of it is, the, well, you wouldn't have bought it in the first place. Better to get a little bit of profit from it than nothing. Um, just we talked about the entry barriers in the last chapter. This is the exact same list, so you don't have to rewrite it. It's the exact same list, but I'm just sort of bringing it back for monopolies. Be the only company in there. These things really are huge, different reasons why they're a monopoly. We talked about them kind of when we saw this list the first time. Um, uh, I'm not going to go over it anymore. But if you want to compete with a monopoly, if you look at the electric company, you say, dude, they're making a whole bunch of money. How can I make a whole bunch of money doing what they're doing? You got three ways to do it. Number one, buy that electric company. You like the money that the Mecklenburg Electric Co-op is making? Buy the Mecklenburg Electric Co-op. And suddenly there, that money is now coming into your pocket. Is that easy? No. No, it's just going to take a whole bunch of money. Because how many people are in a hurry to sell something that is a guaranteed profit generator for them? So, so hard to do, but that's something you do. Buy them out. Number two is look at that list of entry barriers and overcome all of them. What is everything that is in the way? What are the patents that I have to try to fight? Try to license, try to pay money to get permission to do it. What are all of the, okay, they got the power poles going through the county. I'm going to have to rent line and rent space on their line, um, rent space on their poles, run my own wires. So I'm going to have to plant my own poles all throughout the entire county myself. And they're going to threaten to sue me, and I'm going to have to hire lawyers to fight the lawsuits because they're going to be suing me for everything that they can think of. What? Yep. What government rules or regulations am I going to have to deal with? What kind of background checks am I going to have to prove to do to prove that I'm not a drug addict in order so the government will give me the license to let me generate electricity, prove that I'm not a terrorist or whatever I got to prove in order to get permission from the government to do it? Fight all those fights. How easy is that? It ain't. So, option number three, which we talked about the other day, make an entirely different product and sneak in. Like, well, I talked about like, the cable company, cable TV. Instead of cable TV, well, instead of running another wire to every house in the county to bring them cable TV, oh, let's shoot a satellite in space. Cell phones. Instead of running wires all throughout the house, cell phones. Let's pick up a tower somewhere and do a radio thing. Cordless. Come up with something, an entirely different way to do the same thing. And how easy is that? It ain't easy either. So money, determination, or effort for creativity. That's what it's going to take. All three of those. Ain't none of them. Easy. So a lot of times, if you're at the top of the mountain, it's easy to stay on the top of the mountain. It's good to be on the top of the mountain. Unless you buy something. I bet all of the content is Okay. Blackmail information or that kind of thing. Yep. You can try to do that. Yes. Um, I'm starting to make some kind of comment about Robert Kraft, the owner of the uh, Patriots, but I'm going to let that one go right now. For this. Uh, but, so, overall, is a business owner, is being a monopoly a good thing? Crap, yeah, we talked about that. You got pretty much guaranteed profit unless somebody. Guaranteed profit, unless they come and buy you out, well, you just got a whole bunch of money, so woo -hoo. So, not a problem there. So, unless somebody fights all those fights, 
comes up with all that stuff, which is not very likely, or if somebody was to come in sideways to come up with something entirely different. The odds of these have to be fairly slim. You're pretty stable. You're going to be making profit, and you're fairly protected because it'd be hard for everybody else to compete with. So, as a, so then you get to charge whatever you want to charge. Charge rich people high price, charge poor people a lower price, charge old people a lower price, charge them whatever they're taking, the most money you can get out of them. If they're willing to pay a lot, you get a lot out of them. If they're not willing to pay or not able to pay a lot, well, you charge them a lower price, so you can get whatever money you can get. It's good to be the monopoly. For the customer, what do we think about a monopoly? That sucks. Because there's only one company doing it, and so we got to pay whatever price they're being charged. And is that price going to be low? Probably not. Do, does a monopoly feel pressure to have to improve? No, because there's no competition. I don't need to change my product. I don't need to change the way I'm doing things because the customer, what, what do you get in? If you're not happy with me, well, it's too bad because I'm the only game in that. That leaves room. Um, Better. Potentially, doing shoddy work could possibly open the door for somebody to come in and come in. It just depends. The, the higher the up, the higher the barrier entry entry barriers, the higher the obstacles are, the easier it is you can get away with doing shoddy work. But you're not going to do shoddy shoddy work. But it's like we're just going to keep doing what we're doing, and we're not going to improve. Think about our local internet providers around here. In most care places around here, we only have one in any given place. So, has your service gotten worse than last year, too? Maybe not. But has it gotten any better? No. But you go into cities like Richmond or Raleigh or something like that, is the service with the internet providers getting better? Yeah, they get faster speeds every year, faster speed. Year after that, faster speed, and we're increasing data count. Why? Because customers have other options to other. Places that you get your internet connection from. So, it, the monopoly doesn't have to do shoddy work, but they just may not be in that big of a hurry to improve. Because in order to improve, what do they have to do? Spend money. And every penny that they spend trying to improve is one less penny that's going into their pocket as profit. All right? So, they're not in any hurry to improve. So as a customer, the prices are high, and we only have one click, one person to choose from, and there's no reason for improvement. So quality doesn't improve very much. So overall, for consumers, not good. So okay, I, I, I'm sort of I, I'm introducing the chapter. It's two chapters from now. Because I'm going to skip. But just because I used to have it together, but no. Since I got to go out of order, I'm going to go out of order. Yes, I just said that. Um, module ten. We're going to do module ten today. So, prepare for your train wreck. Was I prepared to do this today? And was I prepared to do module 9 today? Probably not, but okay. So, monopolies in most cases are big. Monopolies in most cases are important. So, monopolies in most cases are going to have not only power within the market, they can have political power as well. Do you think? That if somebody at the Mecklenburg Electric Co-op has something to say that the members of the town council would listen? Yeah. You think if the president of Microsoft had something to say, you think the federal government would listen? Is Microsoft kind of a monopoly? So these companies have power. They have influence. Okay, Disney would make less. They're not a monopoly, but a big company has influence, and mm -hmm. monopolies matter. tend to be big, at least in their little areas. So, I'm introducing things here. Monopolies, but overall, they have control. 
over almost everything. They control the price, they control the product, they control if it's going to get improved, when it's going to get improved. They get to control how much are we going to produce. But there's only one thing that they can't control. That's your my demand. They still have to ultimately answer to us. Because, no, I, I've got a monopoly on Eagle Lip Soup. We talked about that the other day, but ain't any of y'all buying it, right? So I've got a monopoly in nothing. So I need to come up with a different product. If the Mecklenburg Electric Co-op was so absolutely evil, 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 then somewhere along the line we all might say, well, let's do something else, let's go back and handle something. Something would happen. Is our demand for the product going to be some other product? Maybe some other product comes along and we demand, we demand instead of cable, that's what happened to cable. Ooh. Home telephone is happening. How many of you have a home telephone? Okay, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Home telephones, how many of you have an actual landline phone to your house? A little over half of you. For those of you that raised, did not raise, those of you that raised your hands and you still live in with your parents? Okay, every one of you. When you move, for those of you that raised your hand towards that, when you move out to your next apartment or whatever, are you going to have a landline? None of you. But it used to be up until, I don't know, 10 years ago, back when we still had to do dialogue. We said, young, don't be in touch. Y'all are still working. You have no idea. Still remember. That was still saying. It's just the harder shorts. But every house in America had a landline. A few houses had two. Especially there near the end of dial up. Then you're like, oh well, if I'm on the internet, then I can't be on phone. And so, so it was cheaper to get a second landline than it was to get a cell phone because a cell phone's the size of a computer. I have no idea. The phone will fit pocket. Anyway, so what ended up happening is there was a monopoly in home phones. It sort of over time, when we decided we don't need home phones anymore because cellular stuff got good enough and phones got small enough and lightweight enough that we're carrying can actually run out and that kind of stuff. So we drifted away. Our demand for home phone wires, the wires are all still there. The phone company is the phone company, and they've got a monopoly, but what's happening with the demand for your landlines is going away. Okay, so we ain't doing dial-up anymore, and y'all don't want to be sitting there fighting with your parents or your sisters or brothers or whatever they get to make a phone call, but y'all don't do phone calls anymore, y'all are texting, that kind of stuff. Right? Y'all like to call that phone Okay, have you heard of it? Uh, so, in demand, even though you did, the local phone company has a monopoly on phone lines and demand going away. It happened. And what, what did y'all just say five years from now? Ain't none of y'all in this room going to have a landline. None of y'all will. Are y'all listening, phone company? So, overall, there's the uh, last bullet point that I didn't get to, so I heard a minute ago. But when you have a monopoly, basically you get four things. Higher prices. Because they can charge a higher price because they, there's no reason why they need to lower their price. Where if you have competition, well, maybe I need to lower my price to steal customers away from the competition so I can keep my business. So you generally you end up with higher prices because of the monopoly, less variety. Because there's only one to choose from. You get electricity from us or you get none of them. You get telephone from us, so you get nothing. Slower innovation, that's you know, coming up with newer, better, and improving, and that kind of stuff that we talked about. They're not in that big of a hurry to do it. And then the fourth one, you get lower employment. If you had two power companies in the counties that won, you would have, I don't know, two sets of repair trucks going out. You'd have two sets of crews that may take wires. You'd have two people, two two different power generators, staff people monitoring it, all that kind of stuff. But even at that, the setup, the higher the price, when prices are higher, do we buy more or do we buy less? When price is higher, we buy less. What happens when price gets lower? We buy more. So if there was not a monopoly here, the price would be lower here, which means you and I would be using more, 
and which means if they're, we're using more, then they're going to need more workers to make the more that we're using. We have more jobs. Set so aside the absurdity of you know, having two power crew, two pair crews, and all that kind of stuff. Just in general, we don't use as much electricity as we would if competition existed and the price was lower. If the price of electricity was so stinking super cheap, then we'd be like, I don't care, floodlights all throughout the house, out in the yard, just go. My house could be lit up like Las Vegas every night, all night long. I don't care. You know, I get a sunburn, suntan while I'm laying in bed at night because all the light shining through the window. The light should be deep enough so you can do stuff like that. If internet was cheap enough and fast enough, think of what all y'all would be doing if y'all had cheap, fast internet, right? Instead of the not so cheap and not so fast and limited bandwidth that we have now. I can tell you the number of things that I've got on my list of things to do the first month after I get real internet at the house. It includes at least two servers and running from there. Well, well, what if I've got my Plex server and I'm just going to enable that to internet access to the planet so I can be sitting here right now streaming my movies and stuff that I've all my DVDs and that kind of stuff. That will be the first one. And then I've set up another data server so I don't have to do Google Drive. I'd set that up immediately. Probably my own email server too. Followed by watch an actual video above 480p. Above, it's only 480p, right? Yes. 360 if I'm lucky. But anyway. So, overall, is any of this good for anybody other than the owner of business? No. Unless you own the business, none of this is good. It's not good for the workers, it's not good for consumers. Ultimately, because of that, you and I, as voters, most of us are not happy, and if voters are happy, politicians do pay attention. Because they want to be reelected so they can continue taking bribes and that kind of So Overall, because of all of that bad stuff that monopolies bring to the economy, the United States government is against monopolies. So, there's a question. There are some monopolies that are beneficial to society, which we'll talk about in a couple of slides. But if a monopoly, if the government looks at a monopoly and says, there's nothing good about you being here, they're going to do one of two things. They're going to keep it from forming in the first place, like keeping companies from, like, I don't know, the T-Mobile and Sprint are about ready to merge. And so we're going to go from four big cell phone companies to three big cell phone companies, but then what would happen if AT&T and T-Mobile, the new T-Mobile, were to merge together, then we're going to be down to two companies, and how's that helping anybody? It ain't because, and then what if they merge with Verizon and then you have one cell phone company and they control everything? Then what's going to happen to the price of stuff? $100 for for digital. Right. So, you know, the, so the government would say there is no reason that society ain't going to benefit because of ATT and T Mobile and Verizon merging together. So, uh uh, we're not going to let you. And they'll look at some monopolies that do exist and they're going to say, because you exist, you're bad enough, we're going to break you into pieces. They did this historically way back in the day with like AT&T back in the 80s because they had a monopoly on long distance phone calls, something y'all can't really relate to anymore, but it used to be you day have to pay like 25 cents a minute to make a phone call outside of your county. Yes. And you had no option. Uh, so they broke them down into a dozen different baby bells is what they call them. And then of course a lot of them have merged back together again a little well. Uh, Exxon, Standard Oil, y'all remember hearing that one in your history class, they broke that one up. They almost broke Microsoft into three pieces back in the early 2000s. It would have been like a Windows division, an Office division, and a Internet slash everything else, Internet Explorer slash everything else division. And in the grand scheme of things, Microsoft probably would have been better off if they would have gone ahead and split that way, but they didn't, and then they just imploded and can't really accomplish a whole lot other than float until finally last year or two they're getting a little bit better. They're only 99% evil instead of 100. But, so that's what you're going to do. If there's nothing good coming from you for society, we're going to kill you. But there are times where it does make sense 
to have a monopoly. Now let's go back to the local electric company. How crazy would it be to have two sets of phone poles, one up each, down, up and down, one on each side of every street in the county, two sets of wires up and down every road in the county, wires crisscrossing across our front yard, the kids can't even go outside and pass the football around because they're going to be bouncing off a wire. And Think of all the trees that we'd be killing for all of those phone poles we'd plant in Dublin. They might want. And then, okay, I don't know, a, a, even a small tornado comes through and knocks down a couple of wires. A big tree falls down. Well, well, one, well, a tree comes down and breaks a, chops through the lines. Well, my repair crew is going to come out to fix my wire, but am I going to fix your wire line? No. So suddenly, there's two repair crews coming out every time a tree falls down instead of just one. Two sets of trucks, two sets of crews, the road doubly blocks, and nobody can drive up and down the road while these two crews try to fix stuff and try not to get in each other's way or sabotage each other along the way. It, does it make sense to have two power companies? No. So, in a case like that, it is beneficial to society to have one company do the work. So, they let those companies, in those cases, they let them exist. And if they do let them exist, they're going to say, no, you're a monopoly, and it's easy for you to be greedy and take advantage of people, but we're going to keep an eyeball on you, and we're going to set some rules. We're going to set some limits. We'll let you exist, but you have to play the game the way we say the game is going to get played. That's what the government is saying. Why would the government let the big, let them not exist? Well, first, ultimately, is because you get a lower price from what we call a natural monopoly. The thing that a natural makes sense. If you had two power companies instead of one, one generator is generating electricity for half of the county, the other generator is like generating electricity for the other half of the county. Both generators are smaller, right? So both generators are going to be less efficient, right? They can be smaller. They can be less efficient. In producing electricity, and if you're less efficient, what ends up happening to your costs? They're higher. So having two smaller power plants might end up might not be able to produce electricity as cheap as having one big power plant can do. That's the number one way that they're going to look at it. Can one produce cheaper than two? Dividing workload. If one can produce cheaper than two, dividing it, splitting out the workload, well, then it kind of makes sense to have the one. But then we recognize, well, just if you can produce it cheaper, well, we need to make sure that you sell it cheaper, right? We don't want you to produce it cheaper and then keep all of that profit saving for yourself. That's where the regulation comes in. That I'm a little bit ahead of myself. Number two is maybe we'll let the monopoly exist to bring products and services to people who otherwise wouldn't get it. Going back to the landline telephones, the government, I don't know how many decades ago, they told AT&T, okay, we will give you a monopoly on phone service, but here's the deal. You've got to make landline telephone access available to every house in America. You've got to run it up every street, so if somebody calls up and says, oh, I don't know how to, they have to go to a kid's house, somebody else's house would call up and say, I want a phone hooked up to my house, they would be able to say, we can do that. We give you the protection of not having to worry about competition, and you get that guaranteed profit to give you the money to run wires throughout, out in the middle of nowhere, to that one house out in the middle of Montana that's 10 miles away from your closest neighbor. That kind of thing. I can't get cable TV where I live, right? I can't get anything where I live. But the one thing that I can't get, there is a phone line running down a farm driveway. That's, the monopoly does that. Otherwise, the phone company would be just like the cable company. What, there's only, what, three houses down a half mile driveway? We ain't gonna make enough money. We ain't gonna do it. So this would be a situation where the government would allow the monopoly to exist. Bring services to people who they wouldn't otherwise get it. Better resource allocation. So, hey, that economy to scale, efficiency, and size thing. This is the you know, really, having two sets of phone calls instead of just one, 
kind of argument there. It's better for the environment. We don't have to cut down as many trees to have two private sets of power poles instead of one. Right. Uh, but we don't have two sets worth of repair trucks going out to every call, polluting the air with their uh, exhaust. Right. Theoretically, more research and development because you don't have to worry about slashing your prices and spending much money on advertising because you're threatened by competition. That should free you up to take money to invent newer, faster, better other things. That's the theory. And sometimes it works. Bell, AT&T, they have a thing called Bell Labs. Any of y'all ever heard of that? Uh, it's, oh, they've invented a whole bunch of stuff. Including a bunch of interesting amount of technology that's behind cell phones and that kind of stuff that they don't have any part of. But they've invented a whole bunch of stuff. But then there's a lot of companies like Mecklenburg Electric Co op. What are they inventing? That probably was not one of the things that they wrote down when they were applying to maintain their monopoly status. And then product standardization. I'm going to go with the not monopoly of Microsoft. They're almost a monopoly. I'm going to give them, I'm going to give them a Microsoft in one minute of love. Windows was on 90 some odd percent of computers. Right. So if you're going to make software and you want to be able to sell it to people, or you're going to make a trader and you're going to want to be able to sell it to people, people got to trust. I'm going to spend $150 to buy this printer and they come home and maybe it's going to work, maybe it ain't going to work. What ends up happening is the printer companies can say 90% of the customers are using Windows, so we're going to make our printer to play well with Windows. So then guess what? When we go to the store, we're pretty confident that we walk out of the door of the store with a printer, it's going to work when you plug it into your Windows machine. All right? That's product standardization. If Microsoft wasn't so dominant, then everybody wouldn't be saying, well, we got to make sure that we play well with Microsoft, and then things would be kind of fractured. Electricity. The power outlets. You plug in in here, you plug in at my house, you plug in at your house, you plug into the gas station, guess what? It, we call it 110, but it's actually working at 120 volts, but it's the same. The phase might be slightly different or whatever, but it's the same. Two, plug, uh, two plugs plus a ground. It's the same throughout the entire country because everybody's got to play with the one power grid that we have to connect to. So, otherwise, it's kind of a voodoo about the, you know, oh, I'm going somewhere, you know, are my plugs going to work? Going on vacation in Florida, are my plugs going to work? Going on going to South Carolina, are my plugs going to work? Out of the country. Out of the country, that's an yeah. issue because uh, there's no global monopoly on them. So apparently in China or whatever, it's like instead of the little, the couple straight lines, like pins, kind of thing. Just but in England or in Europe, it's like one of them's like straight and the other's like sideways. And, so. and apparently, oh, I have learned just recently these power outlets. Y'all know you got the, the two lines up there and then the the ground plug below. Now. That is upside down. If you're building a house, you gotta be flipped over from that. I don't understand, but that's the new regulation there. And sideways, I'm sure there, which this room is probably right in front. This room is consistent. I'm sure there's a right way and wrong way for which direction the ground hole is, but I think I was consistent when I rewired my house. Yeah. Yeah. The natural monopoly is when. One company can produce cheaper at a lower average total cost than two competing firms could do. I'm big, I have a big generator, and I can crank them out at 10 kilowatt hours is my average total cost, is 10 cents per kilowatt hours my average total cost, where two companies with smaller generators, the best they might be able to do is 12 to 12. My 10 is cheaper than their 12 because they're smaller and less efficient. In that case, that economies of scale is a natural barrier to enter. Yes, okay. 
We have two power companies. Both of us have to have a generator. It's smaller, less efficient, but maybe it doesn't cost us quite as much to run. But combined, you would. But I still have to have repair crews that can go throughout the entire county, right? The other one said, does too. I still have to have wires going up and down every street in the county, just like the other one does. So my crew expenses didn't change. My wire expenses didn't change. But what's happening? I'm getting money to pay my crews from only half of you. Or if I was a monopoly, I'd get the money I need to pay my crews from all of you. I would be getting my money to maintain my wires from all of you. Instead, I'm only getting from half of you because only half of you are my customers and the other half of you are customers or my competitor. So inherently, what happens there? Price has to be higher when that, when that efficiency thing comes into play. So, the government says there, there is times where having a monopoly makes sense. Well, because you're more efficient, you can produce it cheaper, that's fine. But we're going to set some rules. And the three we're going to look at is, well, we're going to set some limits to how high the price Excuse me. How high the price is that you're going to be able to charge. We're not going to let you discharge anything you feel like. We're going to set the rule. We're going to set a price ceiling. Y'all remember that's the second week of the semester. We set the price ceiling on how high you can charge. The other thing we'll do is regulate the output of your monopoly. Regulate what you're producing as far as quality and quantity. Because we're going to be saying things like, well, do you want to be the only company making electricity in this town? Well, we want to make sure you crack out enough electricity to where people are going to be running out of electricity on the coldest days of the year, the hottest days of the year, and they can't heat or cool their house. Yeah, we got you know, questions like that that we want to make sure. We want to make sure that you're doing it at a high enough quality that people's electricity isn't surging from all the way down to 100, all the way up to 140, and it's blowing everybody's light bulbs and blowing up their electricity. We're looking for some quality there. And the third one, okay, quality. I have that as a third one. So there you go. So how much they produce, the quality of what they produce, and the price of what they produce. And which is the easiest to monop the easiest to monitor and regulate? The price. The quick, quickest, easiest thing they do is we're gonna limit the price that you charge. Two ways to do it. We're going to talk about one and we're going to talk about the other. Socially optimal, what's best for society, and then fair return. Chat slides for you should use it. To be like you were done. Much better than having a title. Uh, a price ceiling, we talked about that in the second week of class, where we set a maximum price that the government can charge. If you flat out set a price ceiling, in essence, you remember the price ceiling. We're going to limit how much you can charge a customer, and if your cost is above that, we're going to pay you the difference. Do you remember that? So, in that case, the monopoly company would be acting just like it's the department of the government. The government might as well. If the government's going to be paying the subsidized costs of the electric company to make the electricity you give to us, well, why not just the government go ahead and do the make electricity themselves? If they're going to be paying a good chunk of it and covering a whole chunk of it, why not let them do it? You now you only pay ten cents kilowatts and ten cents a kilowatt hour, and then the government pays an extra twelve on top of that. Why not let just the government go ahead and do it and then sell it to us for the ten cents, whatever? If they just did a flat out plain price ceiling. The government is more or less, I mean, the business is more or less acting as if it was a department of the government. The socially optimal pricing is when you say, okay, electric company, what is it? Marginal cost, right? You can see. But we've seen this rule before, right? This is profit maximizing rule of a monopoly, it's a profit maximizing rule of your competition. Based on where you are now, what is it going to cost you to produce, produce the next kilowatt hour of electricity? And that's what you charge. The 
the government is going to look at this. So ultimately, your pricing at your cost, so there is no economic profit because they're operating suddenly as if they were pure competition. The price is the same as their marginal cost. So basically, the monopoly would not be any more profitable than a soybean farm. The government would subsidize the direct payments for anything else. And here again, in this situation, the government, the company is acting like a department of the government. But there's flexibility here. You know, right now, is it very hot? No. Is it very cold? No. So what's the demand for electricity right now? Not a whole lot. So are their generators working very hard? No. They're just sort of cruising. So right now, the electricity that they're producing today is cheaper than the electricity they were producing a month ago. It would be just at your price, day to day, month to month. Some power companies in some parts of the country, they adjust their pricing during different hours of the day because of the demand different hours of the day. They do what's called peak pricing. You're going to be using like and that's one of the things y'all got to think about if y'all going to be getting one of them electric cars, bus or something like that in a couple of years. If they're going to charge you, you, know, you come home from work and you're going to be plugging in at 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the evening. Well, guess what? Everybody else is going to be doing it too. That's peak electric usage. The cost per kilowatt hour of the electricity is going to be higher. 10 o'clock in honor if you go out there and plug in your car at midnight. You can charge your car for a half price if you plug it in at midnight instead of plugging it in at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So that's why you get a little whatever a daily timer thing, thing, thing to where, yeah, you got the car plugged in, but the charger won't actually cut on until midnight. Um, okay, here's the thing. I'm going to do this one of these years. The Tesla company, they they also own, I think this is Solar City, I think it's the name of this. They have some kind of solar companies. They also, not only do they make it successful, makes the battery packs for cars, they make battery packs for houses. Uh, the packs are probably maybe about the size of this desk. You get one or two of them, whatever. It's not going to be enough to power your whole house, but what you do is you pair that with solar cell. So that during the day, you get free electricity to boost this battery, that this battery output is going to help supplement your electricity use when you're there five, six, seven, eight o'clock at night. Right. So you end up getting this cheap. And maybe even if you don't even do the battery thing, you have the solar panels that during the day when electricity is expensive and you're not home, these solar panels can be generating electricity that you can sell to the power company at the expensive rate, and then you turn around and use your electricity when you come home. Or, I mean, well, that'd be selling it to them at a cheaper rate, but then you'd be coming home and using electricity at the expensive rate when you come home. That's why you have the battery pack. So, anyway, they, they, there's games to be played there. And it's good for the environment, too. Um, yes? But the government is going to pay pricing. Why are they going to make cheaper for us? So I'm getting there. And short answer, yes, they kind of do. But then the long answer is they kind of don't. They make it too cheap for that company to not know one. Stay in business. Or they can't stay in business. Yeah. But we're getting there. I've got a story to tell. So in this case, what's it going to cost you to produce it? Well, that's what you're going to sell it for. So you're basically making not much more than just normal playing every day. Here we can have a profit, not, not, not very exciting. So basically, you, the electric company's working for wages is not very exciting. Why am I going to go through all the effort and have all the stress to do all this to have the government set all these rules not barely make any profit whatsoever? Boring. But there's other problems with that. Ultimately, the government recognizes that you can't just produce electricity based on what our needs are now. You have to have an eye for the ugly days of the year. You can't just say, how much electricity do we need on a typical day? And we're going to get, build a power generator to where we have enough electricity to, have, to take care of a typical day, because we have non-typical days. Like there's days in August when it's 100 degrees. 
like those days in February when it's 12 degrees. Right. So what the government says is drinking problem. Uh, what the government says is the electric companies need to have extra capacity to cover those ugly days. The power company, we, we, we want you to be able to have the ability to produce enough electricity on the hottest day of the year and the coldest day of the year to keep everybody covered. So you can't do the, that. The, you can't do that if you're just doing working at the price equals partial cost. So what ends up happening is the government says, well, the price is going to be price equal to your average total cost, and we're going to be looking at the average total cost on the ugliest day of the year. That day when your power plant is running at 110%. Because it's wide open, because it's blankety blank blank cold out there. So the idea is on the hottest days of the year and the coldest days of the year, the electric company is basically breaking even. But the rest of the days of the year, they're going to be making a profit. The price stays the same all year long. And on those very hot days, they're making almost nothing. On those very cold days, they're making almost nothing. But a day like today, the president of the power company is sitting there with a big, fat grin on their face. Because they're making a bunch of money for every kilowatt hour that we're using today. Because it's easy for them to make the money. So that's the thinking there. It's because we want to make sure that we, the power company, can produce enough electricity on those other days of the year. So the price is going to be higher than that price equals marginal cost thing. Because today, it might only cost them six cents a kilowatt hour to make it, but they're charging the same 12 cents that they charge other times of the year. But in the winter, when it's 12 cents a kilowatt hour, when it's cold, okay, suddenly that's, looking, that's not so bad. Yeah, they're making profits 300 days of the year. I'm just guessing. Probably even more than that. No, in you know, December, January, March, they're making a little bit of profit. February, they're making probably no profit. April, May, June, they're making a bunch of profit. July, August, they're making a little bit of profit, maybe none. September, October, November, they're making pretty good profit again. So they got nine months of the year worth of profit to cover every three months of the year that they're not having to make much profit. And so they're okay having a mild winter because woohoo, we win. All right. So if anybody's a fan of global warming, that's an electric company in cold area. Right. I'm sorry. So in both cases, there is going to be normal profit figured in. Because we're not going to have a company of just break even. We're going to make a normal profit, like 5%, 10%, something like that. And it is calculated, and here's where things get fun. The profit is calculated as a percentage above cost. It's cost plus pricing. Say the government says, we're going to let you do a profit of 10%. Well, it costs Mecklenburg Electric Co-op. 12 cents in order to make a kilowatt hour of electricity, what do they get to charge? They can charge about 13.2 cents, right? 10 percent Marco. But if the Brunswick Electric Co-op, it costs them 20 cents a kilowatt hour, well, what do they get to charge? 22 cents, 10 percent Marco. Their percentage, their, co their profit is a percentage of their cost, right? So the nice thing is this blindly, okay, what's your cost? Because, let's say, around here, how many customers is Brent, is the Mecklenburg Electric Co-op serve? A few thousand houses. How much, how many houses does a power plant outside of Richmond serve? A hundred thousand houses. So yeah, they're gonna have a bigger generator, they're gonna have more trucks, they're gonna have more wires, they're gonna have more stuff. Their cost of use is different in Richmond than it is in Mecklenburg, right? So the costs are different. So instead of, can, you, can the government say both companies are going to charge the same price? No. So what they say is, okay, 
What does it cost you to produce electricity in Richmond? Mark it up by 10%. What does it cost for you to produce electricity in Brunswick County? Mark it up by 10%. Or whatever that number happens to pay. So that every company that's producing electricity is getting all of their costs back based on the ugliest day of the year, plus whatever the accepted profit margin is. So everybody is going to make a little bit of profit on the ugly days, and then on the good days, they're going to make more than a little bit of profit. But that's it. And the smaller, less efficient companies that unfortunately the reason why they're small is because they're out here in the middle of nowhere like we are, they're not going to get penalized. Are we okay with this? Is there a problem with this? Is there a big, fat, hairy, red flag to be seen here? And there is. Profit is a percentage of cost. And what did we see on those numbers that I just erased? The more, or the less efficient the less profit. And the more efficient the more profit. You kind of got that flip. The higher your costs, what happened to your profit? It goes up. The higher your costs, maybe the less efficient you are, the more profit you make. Because if your costs are only 10 cents, well, you only get a penny profit. If your costs are 20 cents, you get two pennies profit for doing the same work. So, the problem here is there's no incentive for the power companies to lower their costs. If anything, they're motivated to increase their costs. Because the more our costs are, the more money we spend on the expense part of the voucher, the more money we spend, then that's that much more money that we report to the government to say, okay, then we mark it up by X amount, and this is the price that we get to charge. That's why they have less workers. Right? If, anything, if anything, they do more workers. But and if, they can't just sort of blindly make up costs. They have to have justification. They have to report to the government every year to the State Corporation Commission here at Virginia. They have to say, this is our costs. Every year they apply for it. This is what we want to charge our customers next year. And the reason why is because this is what our costs look like. And they have to justify everything. But here's the thing. Okay, let me ask you this. Have any of you ever seen a truck that belongs to the power company? Any of you? Okay. Answer, have any of you ever seen a truck that belongs to the power company that has rust on it? No. Let me back up. Have any of you, except in the middle of a store, have any of you seen a truck that belongs to the power company that was dirty? That's a lot of good warning. Because here's the thing. What we're going to do is, we're, we're the electric company. You know, we've got these expensive $100,000 line trucks that we use for doing repairs and that kind of stuff. And we know about electricity. What do we know about, like, you know, repairing diesel engines and fixing trucks and stuff? That's not what we do. We need to be reliable. We, we need to be reliable. We need to have a reliable work fleet. We, so we need to trust that our trucks are out there to do a repair whenever service is needed because we're looking out for our customers and our customers' needs because the last thing we want somebody dials this machine to cut off for that. So we need to be prepared. So if our trucks get up to like, I don't know, like 100,000 miles on them, then we've done them, we, we've looked at it, and when a truck gets around 100,000 miles on it, their repair costs start going up, up, up. Their reliability starts going down, 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 and we're not experts in fixing trucks. So instead of us having a garage, hiring mechanics, that kind of stuff, what are we going to do? Once a truck hits 100,000 miles, we're going to replace it. So we have a lower mileage, newer, more reliable truck so we can do repairs to maintain the best quality service for our customers, our reliable service for our customers. So it kind of sounds like the government spending yeah. when they uh, like, oh, yeah, spend at the end of fiscal year so they get more money at the beginning yes. of the next year. Make sure you spend your entire budget or else you won't get your entire allotment things. Yeah. It's, yeah. I'm a manager. Think about the vehicle that I'm driving up in. Am I driving up to a repair? Yeah, I'm not driving in the truck, but I'm not driving up there in a little Honda Civic or something like that. 
Okay, I get a brand new cell phone every year. Because I need to you know, make sure, you know, after a year, your screens start getting messed up and the thing gets lagging, and the batteries don't hold as much charging, but I need to be able to be in, available for my technicians. I get a new cell phone every year with unlimited data. Oh, my laptop, oh, this laptop's like two years old. Time to replace it with one, it'll do things 10% faster, which lets me do 10% more work. Every couple of years, new computer, every couple of years, new thing. Guess what? We just spent $100,000 on a new truck. Bam! Our cost went up by $100,000. 10% profits. We just got $10,000 more profits because we bought a new truck. We just got another $200 profit because we bought a $1,500 laptop. We just got another $100 profit because we just bought a $1,000 iPhone for the manager. Right? Yes, not even counting the unlimited data plan and that guy. The more we do, the higher our profit is going to be. Score. So that's the problem there. Because profit is a percentage of costs. And necessarily for any business, your profit really, and if you start a business, you should do your profit as a percentage of costs. Even if you're not evil, greedy, whatever, like I'm talking about, but just sort of be. As your costs go up, probably your level of effort is going up. And you need the extra reward that comes from it. So if all your other costs and all your other expenses are going up, well, your profit needs to be going up as well so you can cover all of your other expenses personal as well. And that So costs end up being as a percentage of, uh, profit ends up being calculated as a percentage of cost when you're setting your price. That's just a smart way to. That's why people were so mad at Exxon about 10 years ago, 15 years ago when Hurricane Katrina and that kind of stuff happened, and the cost of gasoline went up to four dollars a gallon, and Exxon was posting record profits, and everybody's like, "But y'all are gouging us, y'all are screwing us, y'all are messing." And they're like, "No, no, 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 we just got our formula. What's our cost? Drill the oil and refine the oil, and we add X percent to it." And when it only costs us 75 cents to drill it and refine it, well, then we jack it up by 25% and we sell it for a dollar. Well, if it's costing us $3 to get it out of the ground, well, that's 25% of it. We sell it for three seventy-five. dollars They make a 75 cents profit per gallon instead of a quarter profit per gallon, but they stuck to the same math. It was perfectly legal. They come and investigated them. They had their answer. Nothing happened next on. Nothing happened to BP or any other than BP. Nothing happened to the other gas companies because that's what they did. They said, we're just doing things the exact same way that we did before. We're not gouging people. Cost our profit, our markup is a percentage of cost. That's just sound business practice. So, in this case, where profit is a percentage of the cost, the higher the cost, the higher the profit. So, it's easy for us to upgrade our equipment for reliability and that kind of stuff, but it's kind of Easy to review if you really need an iPhone every year, whether you need it or not. Seriously? Do you need a new laptop every two years? Seriously? Yes. Okay. First, you said, um, you know, they have to set a price they can't go above. So they make it all these expenses. They gotta raise the price. So, what, what, and that's, this happens. Uh, the first ways the government would say price ceiling does not in part. But in this case, Company goes to the government every year. They have to go to the government and say, "We want to raise our price." There's a new price ceiling. It's a new price ceiling each year for each company. They go and they apply and they say, "Look, okay, so whatever, whatever, whatever. Our costs are higher this year than last year, which means we need to be able to charge our customers a higher price." And they have to go up there with that explanation. So pretty much every year, most years, your electric bill. The cost per kilowatt hour changes a little bit. But, but as long as they've got the paperwork to justify, this is why our costs go up. They can't just say, well, we bought a bunch of new laptops. They got to say, well, the reason that we're reliable, we bought this bunch of trucks, because a bunch of our other trucks were falling apart, and we've done a math on maintaining a fleet of old trucks and higher mechanics and this kind of stuff versus just buying new ones and selling the old ones once they get you 100,000 miles, and then we got to worry about them anymore because they're rusting, they're falling apart. 
and they're less reliable. If they got mud and that kind of stuff on them, then there's more of a chance that they're going to be gunking up, messing up, rusting, that kind of stuff. So it's okay if we end up hiring some dude for $8 an hour to be going out there washing wipes my trucks in the parking lot. You know, they did. They have a, whatever justification. The higher the costs go, then the higher amount they can ask permission to charge us every year. And most years, they got lawyers. They come up, they write up all of this justification, right? Oh, and there's legal fees too. You get profit for paying these lawyers to write up all this crap to get you more profit. Woo right. So, yeah. But, they got their paperwork solid. So pretty much just about every year when they go up there, they ask for to, to increase their pay, their, their prices. Most years they get it. A couple of years ago, the they government kicked back on a few of them. At least on our part of the state. I don't know if they would go back here, but but you got but here's the thing. Okay, I don't have here. Okay, you have to be careful. It's a monopoly. Because you can't start saying, okay, let's buy some trucks, buy some computers, buy a new this, buy a new that. Our costs go up and up and up and up and up. Because what happens if they inflate their costs so high? I'm going back to. I can find it. Oh, this and the other other chapter. Okay. The costs go up and up and up and up. What if the costs go up so high that the government does the math and they're like, the average total cost we have, you do it. We've done the math. That's more expensive than if we have two people competing to do it. That's the reason why we let you do this. Is because you can do it cheaper than if we have two com two companies competing against one another. But if you inflate your costs too high, then guess what? Suddenly you just pop that bubble. Suddenly you are no longer doing it cheaper than two companies can. So what's the government going to do in that case? Tear up your monopoly. Let you have competition and good luck. So you got to do what's it limbo. We're going to hold the stick and you got to go under. you got to do the game of limbo. Get as much money as you can and get your costs as high as you can without going over whatever that magic target number is for two companies being able to produce it if they were to compete against one another. If you can figure out what that number is that the government is looking at. So that's the one thing we have that's keeping these monopolies from just jacking it up, 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 up is they know if they go too high, they're going to lose their reason for being allowed to remain a monopoly. So what's that mean for us? Well, guess what? Their costs are a little bit less than the costs of if we had competition, but only a little bit less than our costs if we had competition, which means our price is just a little bit less than what we would have if we had competition. If we had competition, maybe we'd be paying 11 cents a kilowatt hour instead of 10 and a half. I mean, but, so we're saving a uh, half a cent per kilowatt. That's, I mean, it, it, that's, that's where we're at. Because they got to make sure that they don't go over, but they're going to get as close as they can without actually going over. Right? So when the dust settles, this is exciting. Yeah, we have these natural monopolies. We have these monopolies that we're allowing to exist and the government's regulating them. But guess what? When the dust settles, our prices really aren't much cheaper at all than we would be getting if there was competition. Because they're playing the game to make sure they stay in existence. But we should be okay with that because if nothing else, yeah, we are saving a hair of money on our electric bill, but we're saving the environment. And we're not being as wasteful having two sets of power lines running through the county. So we should be okay even at that. So, yeah, we let this monopoly take care of it and manipulate the situation. We ain't really saving a whole lot in our pocketbook, but you, 
young hippies here still are kind of okay with it. So that's why, even though we grumble, even though we gripe, they're not going, and even though my economic savings is very little, we're not in that big of a hurry to go through there and tear up our Mecklenburg Electric Co op and Appalachian Power and whatever electric companies that we have and do that. Um, there was something else that just went through my mind. I can't remember what it is. I'll talk about this and maybe we'll come back. A few history measures. The Sherman Antitrust Act prohibits conspiracy. Antitrust. Okay, I'm slightly shifting gears here, so that other problem is probably gone. Other than this, when have you ever heard talking about somebody with a trust? Trust fund. A trust fund. What is a trust fund? It's a. Kind of like, a, like, a, like an inheritance. A lot of times, yes. It's an inheritance that you can't get your hands on yet. Yeah. Somebody else is managing assets on your behalf for a while. And a lot of times, you talk about these trust fund kids, whatever they rich people, um, what they oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but what ends up happening is like, you know, we've got this money for these kids, their grandpa died, but doesn't want the kids to get hold of this money and spend it until they're like old and responsible, older and responsible. So we're not going to give it to them when they're 12, 21. Right. So, you, what, so you collect these assets together, hold them together, you do, hold them together until the kids get old enough. The other kind of trust is things like, um, a little bit like foundation, like we've got to trust, we pull together some assets that financial assets will pay for expenses to keep something running, like uh, the Arlington National Center, well, that, that belongs to the government. Um, uh, the, the little park in downtown Alberta that's got the, the caboose and that kind of stuff there. There might be some rich person that says, I want that park to stay there for my grandkids, great, great grandkids. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to donate some money and it's going to go into this trust. It's going to go into this account and the money, the profit that this account makes is going to take care of that park to keep it running forever. So my trust is an artificial something that holds assets. The trustee, the some legal legally appointed somebody who's responsible for managing. And here's the thing: what could happen if you can have competition without having competition? Is what the theory is like. Okay, Verizon, AT and T and T-Mobile and Sprint are four different cell phone companies. I'm, Jeff Bezos is rich. He's rich too. He could go out and he could buy at and He could buy Verizon. He could buy, yeah, he's not that one. He could buy at and he could buy Verizon, he could buy Sprint, he could buy T-Mobile. Well, I'm going to keep them as four different companies, but they all belong to me. They're four separate companies, but they all belong to me. And maybe I put all the share ownership in. So are those companies, how hard are they going to be competing against one another? They're separate companies, but are they really separate? The fear is if you're setting them up multiple companies that are technically separate, but they actually aren't based on ownership. That's what the trust was. That's what was happening. Back 100, 120, 130, 40 years ago. They had like Standard Oil. They, and uh, what's the name of the, the Union Pacific? The one Union Pacific. Crap. Uh, one of the railroads, that name is going to come to me one of these days, and U.S. Steel. The steel company, the oil company, and the railroad company. They sort of pooled assets together. They each own shares of each other. 
So there's three separate company, and the railroad company owned a good chunk of the steel company, and a good chunk of the oil company. The oil company owned a good chunk of the railroad company, a good chunk of the steel company. They owned part of each other, so there's three independent companies, and they were kind of acting like one. So the oil company got preferred pricing on a railroad. The railroad company got preferred pricing buying steel to build their locomotives. So they were able to get this competitive advantage because they were separate companies, but they were acting as if they were one company. So picture what would happen if AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon, even though they technically never merged together, but they started behaving as if they were the same company. They would be acting as if they were a monopoly, even if they weren't a monopoly, legally. Uh, this is like, uh, have you heard of a common law marriage? It's sort of, if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, fights like a duck, it's a duck. If you've been living together for seven years and you never actually got married, the government is saying y'all were married. Y'all acting like you're married, you live like you're married, you spread expenses like you got married, you fight like you're married, you're treating like you're married. So when y'all separate, it's like a divorce. She gets half, he gets half. It's, that's kind of what the trust is doing, is they're married without actually being married. So the Sherman Act Trust Act is like, Nope, that's not going to work. You, you can't be a monopoly in everything, but Maine still act like a monopoly. We're going to bust those up. So that's what the antitrust laws are about, is to break up companies from behaving, partnering up and behaving as if they were a monopoly. The Clayton Act prohibits certain kinds of price discrimination and stuff, ultimately as far as price fixing. Had that manipulation I was talking about about Standard Oil's getting a discount on their deliveries on the railroad. And then FTC, Federal Trade Commission, they're the ones that were looking at merchants like AT&T or T-Mobile and Sprint, said we want to merge together so we can compete in this 5G thing that's going to be coming up here next year or two and we can't, we're small enough, we can't do it on our own. And the FTC is going to look at their paperwork, look at their justification, look at their stuff and decide whether they're going to let them two combine or not. That's the governmental department that considers merchants or companies. Um, I think we're very close to being done. So if you yes, this is the last slide I have that. So, antitrust. Keeping companies from acting as if they're a monopoly when they're not. Finding a monopoly and saying, ooh, you're not good for society, we're gonna bust you up. Like what the government was trying to do to Microsoft back in the 80s. Like what the European government is suggesting needs to happen to Facebook and Google right now. They charge them like one point two billion for advertising their own stuff. Yeah, the Google has gotten like three fines from the European Union in the last year for stuff. But the whole big companies that are the only game in town, let's break them up. There's some people that fundamentally have a problem with that. Number one, you're punishing them for being successful. Google's like, well, yeah, we're big. The reason why we're big. It's because we're good at what we do. You go to Google and you put in your search, you put in whatever you want to search for, and what do you find? Whatever you're searching for. You go to Bing and who knows what you get. You go to Yahoo and good luck. And so we delivered what people were looking for, and we got good at it, and that's why we ended up in the number one position because we were good at what we're doing. You get punished for being good. So there's that objection there. Is it Microsoft's fault? I mean, is it Google's fault that the other search engines suck? Now, if Google is doing things to sabotage the other search engines, yes. But if Google says we're good and they're not, that's not their fault. And so people have problems with breaking them up for that. The lack of competition may not be the government's fault. Maybe, you know, I'm the only one here because it's look at those entry barriers. It's thinking hard for to do what it is that we're doing. And we had a hard enough time doing it, we're kind of not surprised that nobody else is doing what we're doing. And then you're going to come and break us up. What are you accomplishing there? And then the third one is, well, we got to be big so we can get efficient. It gives economies of scale because that's what we need in order to compete globally. Is what are those things that we're going to be exporting? Those things we had a comparative advantage in, right? At the beginning of the semester, those things that we do with a lower opportunity cost those things that we can do cheaper than everybody else. And in order to do it cheaper than everybody else, we may have to be big in order to do it. If you want jobs, you want us to be exporting products, that's what you want. 
Uncle Sam and Aunt Virginia? Well, then you, we need to be big in order to be able to do that. So don't break this up. So we see the discussions there. So y'all with me? So we just did whatever this module was. Well, so when we come in Thursday, we will go back to UE 11. Oh, this was 10. Okay. Okay, so we'll come back and we will do 9 next time. And we'll get a fair amount of 9 done through Thursday. Um, yeah, we finished 8. This was last slide. The acquisition overcomes again. So, any questions?